it's foundational yep, to talk. Yep. If we're going to talk about what the workforce that we have now, then we have to talk about what we had before Brown. Mm -hmm. And so before Brown, it's this unbelievable time of black education. So what we know was that black folks, newly freed black folks in this country, the first thing that they built was schools and churches. That's the first thing that they built. They understood that education was liberation. And so they put their money, they got their little whatever they had, and they started building schools. Now, particularly in the South. Dr. Love, thank you for joining the show today. We appreciate you. Oh, thanks for having me. It's good to see you. It's good to see you too. I am. I, I think your book, uh, Punished for Dreaming, actually comes at the right time where we're having a national discussion right now about education that uh, once again seems to be shortchanging Black children, Black youth, and Black people overall. Definitely shortchanging mm -hmm. Black scholarship just in general. So it's a real good time for me. I'm very interested mm -hmm. in what our Black scholars have to say right now because it seems to be missing from mm -hmm. some major parts of the national you know, dialogue. And you chief among them, uh, New York oh, well, thank uh, you. <laughs> Times, New York Times bestselling author. <laughs> not yet, not yet. We're trying to get there. We're trying to get there. <laughs> um, so just to start with, you know, your book, uh, Punished for Dreaming, makes the case that education reform was uh, attached in some way to the national um, war on, on drugs, war on poverty, war on black people, just the war on. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. um, and it's been going on since... Uh, the Reagan administration until mm -hmm. now. So can we just start with um, with that as the basis, you know, as the setting that you yeah. set in your book of what we're seeing today in terms of policies didn't start today. They actually have right. a long kind of tail to them. So what, what's the frame that you see that we should be thinking about this uh, education uh, policy and reform? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for asking that question because I think it really sets the stage and helping people understand that what we're experiencing is not new and what we're experiencing shouldn't be in isolation of all these other things that's happening right now. So you saw the Supreme Court, you know, dismantle affirmative action and you saw the Supreme Court dismantle women's rights. We have to put those things in conversation because each of those things, even though they're in different fields, different policies, different reforms, they're actually working in tandem because folks have been organizing, particularly for the last 40 years, very concentrated to, you know, take away women's rights, to take away queer rights, to take away the rights of Black folks and education. And so this really started for me and where I trace is Reagan's presidency. Now, how did that happen, particularly in education? There was a report that was floating around that was written in 1980, before Reagan even takes office, that really wants to go after education and paint it in the worst light as possible. So that report is happening. The right is already having these conversations around the problems in education, how they want to paint education, how they want to defund education, right? That conversation is happening in the 1980s and before. Reagan takes office 1981. That report starts to surface. And it starts to be something that the right says, we want to be policy. We want it to be a national conversation. So let's put a pin in that. 1982, Reagan declares a war on drugs, which is a war on black people. We start to see, right, the forming and the shaping of what we would see is the prison industrial complex, targeted mass incarceration. I'm using the words of Erica Minor here. And we start to see the racist criminal punishment system began. So that's the framing of 1982, a war on drugs. Now, we go back to education. 1983, we get this report, a nation at risk. And that report and much of the language and ideas of that report is taken from that report that was lagging around in 1980, and it goes into a nation at risk. So the data in that report is misleading, skewed, and sometimes outright lying in that report. But that report says that this nation education system is failing so badly that it's a national crisis that could result in a, a foreign power taking over this country, right? It is fear-mongering to the 10th degree. Now, in the same year, 1983, we also get the D.A.R.E. program. Who was the D.A.R.E. program created? Daryl Gates, the, the police chief during Rodney King's beating 
almost execution. The same police chief that said, black people have different esophaguses. So we, you know, when you put them in the chokehold, it's okay. The same police chief that said during the Olympics, the LA Olympics, we're going to pretty much barricade black and brown folks from their communities. We're not gonna let them leave their communities during the Olympics. This is that police chief who creates the D.A.R.E. program. What is the D.A.R.E. program? A program that has not seen any results. We know that students who enter the D.A.R.E. program and complete the D.A.R.E. program actually use drugs at a higher rate than those who don't complete the D.A.R.E. program. But the D.A.R.E. program now allows police in our schools in a particular type of way. And it's a framing that there's good people and there's bad people. And those bad people got to go to jail. And for a t-shirt, how about you snitch on your parents? How about you snitch on your community? <laughs> right? They had an actual snitch, a snitch box. Well, you know, a community box. But it was a snitch box. Now, that's 1980, 82, 83. By 84, Reagan releases another report, which again, misleading data, called chaos in the classroom saying that our classrooms were so rude and these kids were so rude and disorderly that we needed cops in school. So you start to see the framing of crime reform and education reform just in those four years of the Reagan administration. By 1989, you got cops on TV every day. Bad boys, bad boys, what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And by 1994, you have the bell curve that comes out and says that black folks are inherently um, intellectually ins insufficient. And by 1996, Hillary Clinton famously says they are super predators. And black children become super predators, thugs, crack babies. This is the 80s and the 90s. And you start to see educational policy reform shaped by crime reform. So what happens when you believe that a group of children are disposable? Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. the background of that is broken window theory, uh, zero tolerance. All of those things become educational policies coming from crime reform because you believe a particular thing that is unfound, has no data around black people's intellectual proudness, around this idea that we are criminals, and around this idea that these crack babies are disposable. And you start mm. to see educational policy sh shaped from that. So Reagan, all the way up to Biden, we can trace each presidency's anti-blackness, Obama too, anti-blackness and disregard for black children throughout educational policy for the last 40 years. And so the book traces that and shows you how it shows up in real people's lives. So, uh, and I want to come back to this. Uh, you just mentioned Barack Obama. Boy, you got a, you got some smoke for him in one of the lines that you wrote in this book. And I'm going to say it later. I'm not going to say it right now. But um, so, I, you know, as I was reading, I was trying to make the connection, a strong link between what po policies were from that kind of anti-Black uh, war on uh, black and poor and brown, let's be clear, mm -hmm. communities with the war on drugs, the over-incarceration, the kind of punitive retributive uh, policies that are on that side of the fence and the policies that are connected to those uh, in schools. Like the closest that I could come to is discipline policy. The way that we treat mm -hmm. discipline is very retributive. It's very punishing. And we've had a long-term movement to reform that to make it more restorative, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what other ways did it show up in policy, like academically show up in policy? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first thing we have to think about is, for me, is high stakes standardized testing, right? We know particularly high school exit exams, right? So if you have a high school exit exam, I'm from New York. New York has the most ridiculous high school exit exams called the Regents. You have to pass like seven, eight tests at the end of high school to get a high school diploma, the Regents diploma. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. we know that high school exit exams increases your likelihood of incarceration by 13%. And we the, also wait, wait, know, say that again. So the exit exam increases your chances of- Likely incarceration by 13%. Because huh. if I don't graduate high school because of these exit exams, the likelihood that I will be incarcerated, because we know that brothers and sisters and non-binary folks who are incarcerated, a great number of them do not have a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. A good number of them do not read on grade level. So when I don't graduate high school, the likelihood that I will be incarcerated greatly increases. So when you put exit exams at the end of high school, I've been there the whole time. And now you put these exit exams at the end of high school, you are increasing my likelihood 
of incarceration. So on that point, it feels like it's not the exam that's increasing your likelihood of incarceration. It's the um, it's reading, right? Like the majority of people in in prison actually are functional, functionally illiterate. And they all did, you know, 12, 13 years of traditional public school. And it doesn't seem well, like I don't the know if they all did the 13 over. years of like traditional public well, I mean, school. But I, I, for but years, I, I, you know, our people have been going yeah. to these schools and then going to jail afterwards uh, and, <laughs> and not getting, not gaining literacy. The thing that black people have always fought for is literacy. Always. Right? Always. That's and, and I'm not sure beginning. we'll get to this. You know, this is why I'm arguing for reparations, right? Because we have been so poorly educated in these schools, which impacts your earning potential for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And so this is how we have to be thinking or just carcerality in the way in which police show up in schools, the way metal detectors show up in schools, dogs show up in schools, cameras show up in schools, the way we have more police in schools and social workers and nurses and, and, and psychologists, like, like the ways in which that criminality shows up in our schools each and every day. We have a situation right now out of Florida that happened two weeks ago where mm -hmm. black students were all put in the mm -hmm. auditorium for an assembly and then told, hey, you all are failing. You're going to go to jail if you keep failing. You're going to get mm -hmm. killed if you keep failing. How about you all compete to be better and we'll give you some chicken wings and a gift card, right? So it's not even always about a police officer in the schools. It's also about how we see black children, how we treat them, how we talk to them. I'm sure you can talk to children right now, black children right now, where a teacher has said to them, you're going to end up in jail. You're right? talking so to one. You're talking to one. <laughs> right. So I heard that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not only about the test or only about police in schools. It's about the way in which we see black people and black children as always criminal. And mm -hmm, it plays mm -hmm. out in our policies. And that's what the book is really trying to get us to understand. It's our policies of how it plays out. You know, on that point, there was a study not long ago, I'm sure you saw it, where they asked, asked teachers to take a look at some video of students uh, sitting at a table and they wanted, they told them, we're looking for you to detect misbehavior. So the teachers looked um, at um, at the students and there was no misbehavior on it was it was a kind of like a placebo in a way um, there was no misbehavior but um, there was eye tracking software to see where they were looking and they were constantly looking at the black boy at the table and then secondarily to the black girl um, they weren't even looking at the white kids so they were looking mm -hmm. for misbehavior and they were training their gaze on the the two black children sitting at the table even though there was no misbehavior they found some um, mm -hmm. And the thing that threw me back about that particular study was when they said, and the black teachers did it too. Yeah. Um, I was like, what, you know what? Like, like wow. Um, so that's not, how, is, how does that, that's a teacher thing. We have 3 million teachers in the United States. Many of them walk into our schools every day without the right ideas about our children. Um, and that has nothing to do with the things that we call reform. That is like a, like that's who our workforce is since 1954, our workforce, who our kids are with every day has changed, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, like prior to 1954, the average black child was in the care of a veteran black educator every day. Mm -hmm. um, today, that's like two, three, four percent, right? In my state, Minnesota, it's 96% white women, or white, mm -hmm. uh, mostly women, um, who mm -hmm. our kids are in, in classrooms with every day. Now, this is what I want to say about that. Doesn't that call for reform? Like there's so much in the book about like, you know, reform being the problem. But when you see these other problems, it's like it, it almost begs to reform the system in some ways. Can I back up and talk about before 1954? Yes, please, please. Because I think it's like I, I, foundational. <laughs> it's foundational yep, to talk. Yep. If we're going to talk about what the workforce that we have now, then we have to talk about what we had before Brown. Mm -hmm. And so before Brown, it's this unbelievable time of Black education. So what we know is that Black folks, newly freed Black folks in this country, the first thing that they built was schools and churches. That's the first thing that they built. They understood that education was liberation. And so they put their money, they got their little whatever they had, and they started building schools. Now, particularly in the South, White folks did not educate their children in the South. 
It was black people's idea for public education in the South. Du Bois talks about this in Reconstruction. They, were not, they weren't even involved in that. It was black folks who said, no, 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 all children have to be educated down here. And so they, create, they start to create public education. But what they also do is build HBCUs and colleges to train teachers. And so we start to train and have not only a plethora of black teachers, but highly skilled and highly credentialed black teachers. We're talking black teachers with master's degrees and PhDs who are unbelievable. And again, a bulk of that work is black women. They are the vanguards of black education in this country. So here they are, 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s. In the South, and this is the work of Leslie, uh, Leslie Fons Fonswick out of Howard. In the South, those teachers make up anywhere to 30 to 50% of all teachers. We go to Linda Tilbin's work. Black teachers are 90,000 black teachers are almost teaching 2 million black children. And they are highly skilled, highly credentialed. But what we also know about these black teachers is that they had a deep sense of community, that they pretty much was working seven days a week. I'm teaching five days a week. Saturday, I'm volunteering here. Sunday, I'm going to two, three church services to make sure I see all my students' families. Like they're working for the community. They deeply believe in racial uplift and education as a mechanism for that. Now we have Brown. Brown versus the Board of Education is the landmark case that says we're going to desegregate schools. We're going to integrate schools. And that I would argue that at the time for democracy, for this country to call itself a democracy, you can't have a segregated school system. The whole country is looking at us as a joke. Russia is saying, these are the people who are trying to tell us what to do, and they look how they're treating their black people. Now, Russia don't love us in any particular type of way, but they're using that as an example. Mm -hmm. So Brown becomes this huge political machine to show the rest of the world that, no, this country isn't that bad. So the Brown decision is unanimous. But what we lost when we tried to integrate schools, and I say tried because we never actually did it. There was a brief period where we had a little high numbers of integration, but we never as a country ever did it because one group came to the table and the other group left. And mm -hmm. they created segregation academies. They created the suburbs. They expanded the suburbs. They took their money and their resources and their wealth with them and left us there. But what they also did was create policies and reforms and laws to keep black teachers out of the classroom. So here we are, you know, almost 69, 70 years since Brown and black teachers making up less than 10 percent for the last 40 years, where we used to be 50 percent of the teaching population. They have gutted black education. And now you have teachers who are not being walking into the classroom that don't know that history don't know the beauty of black education, don't know the beauty of black children. And I talk about it all the time in my previous book and in this book a little bit is the idea that the way we train teachers in this country is not to see black excellence, to not to see black creativity, to not to see black beauty. They don't see it. You have one diversity class that tells you all the ills of everybody. Mm -hmm. And then you walk into the classroom and in many of these schools reinforce those stereotypes about black children. So we got to think about the way we train teachers and who gets to train teachers. And in many times, the curriculum that we're training teachers with does not do the type of work that we needed to do for them to understand, no matter who they are, that those stereotypes and the ways in which you see Black children is a stereotype. How do you unlearn that? How do you do some deep understanding to get at the root of why you believe what you believe? We don't do that. And so they're walking in with these stereotypes from sometimes their teacher education programs. So the struggle that I had in reading your book was the idea that the, the main enemy, the main villain of the book is reform, school reform, mm -hmm. testing, charter schools, vouchers, um, people who have been associated with the reform, the so-called reform, you know, leading from the Heritage Foundation to Barack Obama. It almost puts them on equal planes in some ways, which for me felt like a really big um, stretch for me to go there because I need a like a precise definition of what reform is then because when I think about what has to happen for us to have truly educated black people it requires a reforming of the system from top to bottom and no one 
is uh, immune to that criticism. Everybody needs to get that smoke. There are, there's an entire population of middle class people who are harvesting black children and brown children for their per pupil income. And they are in all uh, different parties. They're in all different levels of government and ways in which, and, and in some ways, if I was a white woman educator um, reading your book and reading your work, I would think I was somehow immune in some ways because it's really those reformer people that are the problems, the people who want testing, the people who want charter schools, the people who are part of the Heritage Foundation, the corporate Democrats, whatever. And it would be my way to say, I could ignore the fact that our children are, pull, pull all those people aside. Our children are in systems and you just named one of the systems, for instance, there's some questions that have to be answered and then reformed. Where do our teachers come from? How are they being prepared? Are they really being prepared? What are they taught? When they arrive in the classroom, what are they prepared to do? How can they help children reach their highest potential? How do we know? Like, what, are, what is the data and the evidence that we're making forward progress with our children? Because for many years, the school system averaged us into the white population, and then we were invisible, right? It wasn't until we started disaggregating the data that we could start seeing problems. And the basis of every civil rights lawsuit against schools starts with test scores. Right, every civil rights lawsuit that we've ever had that gave us pro uh, progress to prove that the system is inadequate um, has been, uh, you know, like data and information. So, what's the what? If that corporate reform thing isn't the thing that we want, what is the real reform though? Because we do want some reform. We want something to change. Maybe we shouldn't call it reform. We just want change. And, and I know, like, um, um, the last part of your book, you you have a solution which is, you know, reparations. We first have to name the problem, like people were, were harmed, they were hurt uh, in all these years. And when you see harm, you have to repair, right? You have to do something. So, um, so part of that is financial, but what are the other parts that you would need to see as somebody who's an educator, somebody who knows the system very well, what would you be calling for in terms of reforms that we need for our kids? Yeah, I want to answer that question, but you had some other things you leading up back? to that question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I want to go back to in that question. <laughs> I did layer a lot so, in there. <laughs> right. That was, that was, it was a lot, but I, I want to try and get to some of those points. I think number one is the word reform is problematic in itself. Because when you use the word reform, and we've talked, I mean, it's not just education reform, it's crime reform, it's education reform, welfare reform, immigration reform, right? We kind of see reform and we use reform as this word, as a catch-all that says, if we reform it, then somehow we're going to fix it. We're going to make it better. But we don't understand that at the very foundation of this solution or this thing we're trying to fix, it's broken from its core. So you can't really reform something that is inherently broken and it is working the way they wanted it to work. So public education in the way in which it was set up was not set up for black people, women, neurodivergent people, disabled people to ever be part of this structure. So we look at education from the very beginning. So what we are trying to do consistently is try to input something in the system that was never intended to be in the system. And then it shoots it out. Hmm. And then we say, we're going to try and put it back in. <laughs> then it shoots it out. We're going to try, we keep, so what we keep trying to do is be included. And when you are trying to be included in a structure that was never intended for you, you will be excluded because it doesn't want you there. It wasn't built for you to be there. So that's reform. Reform is always saying, we can fix this thing that never wanted you. And the system is saying, okay, you can tinker with the edges and you may be able to get a little progress here and there, but at its core, you will, get, you will never get to its core. That is reform. And we've seen that throughout history with multiple disciplines, with multiple fields is how they keep trying to reform this thing. And then here we are, kicking it down to our children saying, you know, the children are the future. They're going, no, because you don't want to change the actual system. So that's what the book is trying to argue is that the system is not actually broken. It's working the way they intended it to. So you can't reform something like that. That's number one. I think number mm -hmm. two, you said, you know, if, if you're a white woman reading this book, you kind of feel like if you're not doing the things that these corporate folks are doing, then you're kind of off the hook. But I do have a chapter in the book called White People Save Yourselves. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah. yeah. And that chapter is to mm -hmm. make sure if you have read this book, that once you get to this, you understand this is about you. Mm -hmm. Save yourself. Save your family. This is the internal work that you have to do. 
So how you walk into the classroom every day with these stereotypes and the things that you hold on to, you are doing the same type of super predator punishing work that these corporate folks are doing. So I make sure to name those names and to name it on a very personal level for white folks. And I say to white folks, listen, black folks, we, we good. If mm -hmm. anything that black folks have shown you for the last 400 years is we gonna make a way out of no way. We are good. What we would like you to do is remove the barriers. You know, you can um, leave us alone and remove the barriers because we have shown you that we are good. What we need you to do is save yourself because yeah, racism he, impacts you too. You make a challenge to DEI. I thought that was pretty surprising in the book. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you like just openly challenge and, and then you you recover it. You know, it's not like you you discount it. It's just that, no. you know, you, so, so what's your, um, what's your, what's your problem, Dr. Love with the, <laughs> I, I mean, diversity, equity, and inclusion, how could that, how could that have any problems? That we, that's what it we want, so right? Sweet. It, it sounds, sounds so sweet. Nice. It sounds so nice. It does. So nice. It's what I want you know, in school. So. It's what you want. Yeah. yeah. But what, what I argue in the book is that, okay, DEI sounds great, but I'm, interviewed for the book, multiple DEI leaders. I know DEI leaders around the country. I know folks who do this work. I work with many DEI folks. And what many of them have told me, what I've seen, what I know is true as a parent, as a researcher, as an educator, is that first of all, most DEI positions get hired because of an incident. So you're, you're hired to fix this incident. You're supposed to come in and be the Olivia Pope and kind of fix this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the DEI person who's supposed to be the fixer. Now, one person cannot fix a whole institution. So they come in, they're hired to fix this problem. Then they're hired with no staff, no power, and no money. You can't do equity work with no staff, no power, and no money. They are typically mm -hmm. teams of one. They have typically no resources to do anything. I've seen DEI folks with a budget of like $1,000. You pretty much going to get the kids some snacks, some pizzas throughout the year and call it a day. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, you have no power at the table to make any structural changes for the institution that you are working in. Now, what you can do is you can report to that institution about how racist they are. You can report to that institution about how transphobic and homophobic they are. You can report to that institution about the climate change, about, about the climate study that they hand out every year. But actually to sit at that table and say, we're shifting it this way. We're doing it in that way. Most DEI professionals do not have that type of power. So what yeah. it becomes is a type of holding spot for racism and to teach young folks. So, you know, you talk about, you know, you are into adult education. That's what I think DEI is. It's adult education. It's trying to help teachers and parents and school folk to be less racist. It's trying to teach them about the things that they're saying and some of the curriculum challenges that they, they're having. That's not equity. You learning about equity is not equity. You <laughs> learning about diversity is not diversity. Yeah. And so I think these positions are needed but if they have no power, we can't see that as justice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and you tokenize the position almost in that way, right? Yes. Uh, when you when you said it, you sometimes your department of one, really your job is actually to give cover to the system to say, hey, we did that. We invested in a person. Correct. And what we're seeing right now is a lot of those people get fired now because now there's a, a you know disinvestment in diversity, mm -hmm. equity, and inclusion. Right. And so we're seeing a huge either exodus but we're seeing individuals get fired from it. Why? We're done. We, we, listen, we had 2020. We had the whole George Floyd, Breonna Taylor uprising. We have the right coming at us with book bans and, and mm -hmm. CRT bans. We don't want any of this smoke. So yeah. we, we're done with that. We're done. And so all the commitments, all the investments somehow are just fading away. Because we know, as you said, it was a cover. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to seem like we were at the time Black Lives Matter. I mean, you had institutions saying Black Lives Matter that wouldn't even give people hazardous pay in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You had mm -hmm. institutions that have a shabby record of even hiring Black people, retaining Black people, and particularly Black people in like C-level suite positions talking Black Lives Matter because it was politically at that time what they knew they needed to say. And now that they feel like that moment is over and Black lives don't really matter anymore and it's off the national um, agenda, they moved on. So they show you who they are through these positions. You know, Dr. King always said, your checkbook 
well, show me who you are. Mm. <laughs> Cause budgets are a moral document. Like and what you spend on. There you, you know, go. Yeah. There um, you go. So I was jarred a little bit in your book. There's a concept you talk about the educational survival complex. And there's this, mm-hmm. this quote that goes along with it. I define this phenomenon as the exploitation of compulsory education by the ever expanding carceral state, private corporations, wealth managers, philanthropy, education reformers, local and state politicians, celebrities, real estate, the testing industry, and each U.S. president to fill school buildings with black children who are educated to make profits for the uber rich and to undo American democracy. That's a pretty tough line, Dr. Love. Well, that, that's you. a I pretty, that. yeah, that, that, that's, <laughs> there's all, and it's doing a lot in there in one paragraph. Um, what do you say to people who hear something like that though? And they, they, they feel like it's, um, it's attacking, you know, everything they believe that the system is, is, is basically good, but can be tweaked to make, be made better. So this feels very heavy handed to them in some ways. Um, you know, what do you say to people to get them to see the reality that this is a big carceral system? Well, you know, it's, <laughs> it's the same conversation you say about, would you want to be black? <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, if you feel like, okay, send your kids to these schools then. If you feel <laughs> like, oh, that's, you know, that I didn't send it, to, send yeah. your child to these schools and, and see a four day. If you believe that that definition <laughs> is not true. You wouldn't do it. Why wouldn't you do it? Because what I'm trying to explain when I talk about black children being in the educational survival complex is that everybody is trying to profit off of black children. Mm -hmm. And they profit even more when black children fail. So the system is designed for us to fail. If you look at what's happening in Michigan, take, take a state like Michigan. In 2016, 79, 78% of all charter schools were filled with black children. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not someone who's like, charter schools are terrible. I think there's some great charter schools in this country. I think there's some great public schools in this country. That's not what you say in your book, Dr. Govan. We're challenging you on that. That's not what you say in your book. And I wanted to get back to that, but keep going, keep going with the Michigan example. Okay, so we can get back to that. (laughs) So what, what I also say is that if you look at the history of how charter schools have been used, that is where we start to see a huge issue. Where we see philanthropists, we see white corporate execs and black corporate execs, we see celebrities all have charter schools in their portfolio. Why? Because they are making money off charter schools. They are buying up buildings and selling the buildings to charter schools um, for rent. They are creating their own curriculum that is not founded. They are not teachers and selling that curriculum charter schools and They are buying charter school networks and profiting off those charter school networks. And they have politicians who are ensuring that even when they do a terrible job, Betsy DeVos, that they are going to be able to get reauthorized and have no oversight. So what you're seeing in Michigan right now is where laws have been passed to make sure that school charter schools have no little to no oversight. And the schools that are doing poorly, that should be closed, can't be shut down. Because they have lobbied for that and laws have been passed for that. So when you think about all these folks from the wealth managers to the celebrities to the politicians, they are all extremely invested in charter schools. Why? Because this is a way for them to make money. And so now here we are as black folks just trying to survive the system. Just trying to do our best. Mm -hmm. School should not be a place you just have to survive because everybody is trying to make money off your demise. That's not what yeah. public education should be. It's not what public education should be. I mean, public education should result in the education of the public. It should be resolving, you know, that the how good the system is, no matter whether it's charter, private, whatever it is, it should just be marked by outcomes. What are people capable of doing when they leave your system? Are they capable? I, I, I worked in the welfare system for a period of time. I had the experience of helping people fill out um, applications to damn Arby's and McDonald's and whatever. And it would always trip me out that I was putting high school graduate in, in the box and saying which high school it was a person went to. And it was hitting me every single time I'm helping you fill out an application for a job that's going to keep you poor after you did 13 years in a system, right? That was supposed to, at least you should be able to do what I'm doing right now, which is fill out this application, right? Um, And, and, 
and, and you know, and I don't have to convince you of this, but the job I'm trying to help you get is going to keep you poor. Even this job, you're not, you, you're not even ready for this. So, but, but to back up on the charter thing, and this is where, you know, I have to be very honest and transparent. I actually don't see the, the charter um, story the same way that you see it. I live in the state that gave the world charter schools. Our charter mm-hmm. schools are mostly from the communities that they, um, we have community charter schools. They, they come out of the Somali community, the Hmong community, the black community, the Native American community in a very racist state and a state that doesn't think it's racist, but it's like 90 something percent white, right? So the these schools actually were a lifeline for communities that begged the traditional system for years to do some culturally responsive work. Like Native American people were worried that their kids were losing their language and their culture and whatnot. And they approached the district multiple times with, um, with plans, like let us help you help our children only to kind of get the stiff arm. And that's really where charter schools came from. And that's really the same way that they go down now to what you just said. I would never use Michigan as a good example of like anything, charter schools, regular schools or whatever. I just never would. (laughs) I mean, that state is like the armpit of American education. So it's like the worst possible example of anything. But it's not the main example, for instance, with charters. And my problem is this. If you have a racial analysis of public education in the United States, no one goes untouched. We cannot just talk about charter schools and not talk about um, magnet schools and the way that magnet schools have gone down since the 1970s. When I was coming up in the 1970s and then the 1980s, magnet schools were supposed to be an integrative source of hope with special programs for everybody. They stopped being that in like the 1990s and started becoming white islands of privilege to keep white folks in school districts with Olympic sized pools and special programs. Mm and limiting the number of Negroes that can get in. And now you have a whole system of magnet schools across the United States that never get any smoke. They never get any smoke, but you know, they are talking about discrimination. They're discriminating before they even let you in the building because they're just using test scores to keep you out of the building in the first place. For many of them. Well, I'll talk about New York City and what they're doing in New York City in the book. And New York is is very, like, very kind of medieval, like system of who gets in and who doesn't, you know? And like you said, the thing about in New York is that it's already set in stone. They already have a picking order before you even apply. Some of the most richest districts in New York, they already have seats in the written room. So it's not even like you're up, you're you're not even playing the same game. Mm -hmm. And you have Mm -hmm. some of the world's, I mean, you have Nobel Prize winners and top scholars coming out of these specialized schools in New York. And like you said, in the 60s and 70s were created for black and brown folks. And now they are almost exclusively white and Asian. And what we saw in New York, what we saw in New York is that in these schools that a freshman class could be 700, they'll admit one, two black students at these specialized high schools. So I got a whole, I got a whole section on them too though. So I don't, you know, they're in there because what's happening in New York city when they call themselves the melting pot, the most diverse, you know, da 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 this. Yes, but when it comes to their school system, New York City is one of the most segregated school systems in the country. And as you said earlier, they are hoarding resources. And it's a blue place. That's the that's the part that actually, mm. you know, this isn't like mm. some red district somewhere where, where we would expect something like this. But this is the point I was trying to make. You know, first of all, I do support charter schools um, that come from the community, that come mm-hmm. from the communities. I think communities have a right to educate their own children. And, you know, just like we talked about um, 1954 being this kind of special time in history, um, this before and after point before 1954 and after 1954, the world was different, Mm -hmm. right? I feel the same way about 1968. So when the black community in New York fought for community control of schools and they they did something akin to a strike and they took over their Mm -hmm. schools. And in the days that they had taken over those schools, they created their own curriculum. They brought in their own teachers, many who were white and Jewish, who came to teach young teachers who came to teach while the schools were shut Mm down. Um, And the way... That's the Alamo. In black education, 1968 is the Alamo because the way that they were crushed for, punished for dreaming. Yeah. The hey, way that, hey, the way that, that. <laughs> the way somebody <laughs> wrote a book called Punished for Dreaming, the way that the, the Afrocentric black folks of, of the 1960s who wanted to run their own schools were treated mm-hmm. is very much punished for dreaming. And they were crushed and they weren't crushed by corporate. They weren't crushed by Bloomberg or, you know, pol- politicians or any of that. They were crushed by the the profession of teaching. 
like teachers actually organized into this thing called a union, crushed that out. And then Shanker went across the country teaching other districts how to crush black militants in education, saying basically know the signs when they're coming and this is how you defeat them. Um, that for me is is a before and after point because black people did used to dream about educating their own and we're not given a lot of license to educate our own right now. Not only are we seen as not capable and, and you know, inferior as students, as educators and as people who should have control of their own education, we're not given much credit for being able, like no one even dreams that. Like no one even dreams that we could go back to what we had before 1954. That's a problem to me. That's a real problem. How do we get more power? How do we get more power in being able to determine how our children are being educated? So there's there's a, uh, an author by the name of Leslie Stewart, and it, it's it's really also playing on the work of Zora Neale Hurston, right? Zora Neale Hurston was someone who was really against Brown versus Board of Education. She kind of mm-hmm. just said she wrote something called "Court Order Can't Make." racist mix. And she mm. just really went into why this was a bad idea. But Leslie Stewart says something that I, that always sticks with me. She says that white people think our lives are tragic without their intervention. And I think that that's, that's it right there. Right? Mm. That, I mean, it gives me chills every time I repeat it to somebody because that is just like, oh my God, yes. They think our lives are tragic without their little interventions. Mm. And so throughout history, right, when we are having the ideas and moving towards self-determination, self-liberation, when we are creating our own things, here they come. Because how, 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 what do they know? And so we see it throughout history each and every time. And that's why for me, the book ends with reparations, because I think reparation puts us on the offense. I'm so tired of being on the defense. It puts us on the offense, because what reparation says is you did harm to me. We're not going to call it a gap. We're not, we, we're going to say you did harm to me. And if you understand that you did harm, then what does repair look like? And I want repair. And another word for reparations is repair. Mm-hmm. And so that's why the book is trying, you know, the book says, listen, there's, there's, there's a 12 chapters in this book. One through 10 is trying to convince you. It's trying to use these stories of a black people to show you how reform played out on their bodies, how it played out in their families, how it played out on their children. Then chapter 11 says, if you believe all that, you got to believe black people are amazing and beautiful and you better celebrate us. Now, if I can get you all the way to that, now here's chapter 12 that says, if you believe everything you've read for the last, you know, 300 some pages, what's the solution then? We have to think about bold solutions. And my, I'm not saying this is the only one, but we have to say, okay, harm has been done and we want restitution for that harm. Because that you are like? impacting. Yeah, what would that look like though? Imp- yeah, so here we go. You are impacting my lifelong earnings. So like you said, you're helping someone fill out an application for poverty for the rest of their lives because of the education that they got. Mm. That's called reparations, right? You are impacting the money that I will be able to make for the rest of my life. That's called reparations. Same thing if you're going to devalue my home and give me less for my home when you know that that is what my home is worth. That is what a trigger of reparations is. The same for education. I'll give you another example. In 2010, there were 100,000 Black students who qualified for AP. They qualified for AP. They had the test scores, they had the grades, everything. But either their school didn't teach AP or they weren't recommended for AP. So those 100,000 students now go off to college and pay more and their student um, tuition because they cannot transfer the AP classes there. So they're losing out. That's reparations. You've done harm to me. You weren't, I wasn't allowed. I was denied these things and now I'm paying more for it. That's reparations. Or we can think about suspensions. When you suspend a child, New York City can spend, can suspend a child up to 120 days. There's only 180 days in the school year. (laughs) So when you suspend a child, right? What happens? Mm -hmm. Does, does that child go home with lunch, breakfast, a tutor, 
school supplies, a computer. They got, they, you should, how do you suspend a child in this country and send them home with nothing from school? And that is their money. That is their per, per pupil. That is actually their money. Each child that walks through that building has a little price tag over their head. Each child. Mm -hmm. And so even when you suspend a child, everybody still get paid. So you suspend that child for two weeks, everybody get paid. What if when you suspend that child, a check go home with them to cover the cost because they are not, they are not in the place that is actually supposed to provide them education, but everybody gets paid and that's their money. But I think we'll suspend now, black children like that. But now, now you're talking, that's a voucher. What you just said That's is not a voucher. voucher I'm supposed voucher. to be in this space. <laughs> I know, but you're just saying the money should follow the child. If you're going to put them out, you no, should no, put no, the money well, out. I'm, That's too, not so. a voucher. <laughs> you, I am here in a public school and you are denying me access to teach me because you are suspending me. And we know that black children get suspended at a high proportion rate for doing adolescent childhood things mm -hmm. where their white counterparts do the exact same and don't thing. Get punished. Yep. And don't get punished, don't get suspended. So that's why this is not a voucher because there's a racial component into how you are treating me. Now, reparations right now in this country, when we think about reparations, okay, the triggers for reparations, the levers for reparations, should I say, are devaluing of my home, devalue of my business, being denied a black, being denied a loan, being denied um, a business loan, mass incarceration, uh, police brutality. Those are levers for reparations. If we're looking at California right now and what they're doing, those are pretty much the categories of reparations around the country. Now, what I would argue is what I try to argue in this book is that, yes, those should be categories of reparations. But before I'm denied a loan, before my business is devalued, before any of those really majors, I am educated as a black person in this school, in this school system which is devaluing me, underfunding me, and punishing me every single day. Education should also be a lever for reparations. But I also argue in the book is that I just, let's be very clear, compensation is important. I don't want to downplay nobody getting a check. Compensation is important. But what also the fullness of reparations is to say, if you can even if you can even wrap your mind around the idea that you harm me and I deserve reparations, then you can wrap your mind around the idea that the system must be overhauled. Because don't cut me a check and then do the same thing to my grandson. But this, so, is, this is where I'm confused a little bit, too. And I think it's important. Mm -hmm. We should keep having this dialogue. First of all, I need to hear from all my black scholars at a time. Black people need to hear like black scholars have something to say and the world needs to hear you. And our, our scholars need to be, I mean, we need to be like, so re reparations is not the destination. Reparations is a pathway to justice. Mm -hmm. The destination is justice, right? Mm -hmm. like, like reparations is only a half step on the way there, right? Um, and and this is like, what, what would justice look like, you know, is, the, is my question. What would the next thing be that we need to have? And everything, like this is the problem with the word reform. Because when you say overhaul the system, to me, that could be taken as reform, right? Mm -hmm. like, like there's things that need to change and we need to change the system. When we talk about police, we talk about police reform. When we talk about criminal justice, we talk about criminal justice reform. And then sometimes we get to the part where we're thinking about reimagining co community policing. That's even be that's beyond reforming the system. That's like rethinking what safety could look like in communities. So in education, what is the version of that, of what would we rethink the thing to be? Because it certainly just can't be making some tweaks on, as you said earlier, a system that was broken from the beginning, right? Um, it has to be something like our black scholars should be running schools. Our HBCUs should be running schools. They should be having lab schools like Chicago has a lab school for white kids. Uh, our HBCUs should be having lab schools for black teachers and for black students and for all of us to have some intergenerational learning. That would be my reimagining of how we get out of this. But what would be yours? So we could just go to Tennessee State, which is producing some of the most uh, phenomenal black teachers in the country right now. It has been a pipeline for black teachers. So we're seeing HBCUs do that type of work. I would say first to your point about black scholars, like I think we need to name them, right? Goldie Muhammad is an unbelievable black scholar who does work on reading and what we need and the interventions that we need for black children to have success in literacy. We talk about Yolanda Silly Ruiz, who does work around racial literacy and what that would look like. We need Rich Milner from Vanderbilt, an amazing black man who does work. He has a new book called uh, The Race Card, 
who does and talks about race and poverty in ways that are really, really important. Dave Stovall is another research out of Chicago. Tyrone Howard, we need those individuals. Lee Patel, we need those individuals. So we got to be able to name names. Can never forget the GOAT, Gloria Latson Billings, who needs we need to be up in there. Uh, Christopher Emden, we need to be up in there, right? So these are the folks that are doing the work. Dina Simmons needs to be up in here. So when we say Black scholars, we need to name their names so people know exactly who we are talking about. Cynthia Dillard work needs to be up in there. So I'm really, I'm really clear about the lineage that I come from. And, and the one who trained me, Asa Hiller. So these are names that folks need to know. Now, when you think about if those folks ran the schools, if those folks were given the opportunity to actually say what justice would look like, but reparations is needed because we need funding. It's just not ideas here. We need actual funding. And what we need is those po people who are doing harm to move to the side and stop. So what I say in the book, right, Bill Gates, please cut a check, but don't think you're going to be in charge of educational reparations. Mm -hmm. Like, please cut the check, but we need you to move to the side. So mm -hmm. also with reparations, if these folks to move to the side and make way for the actual educators, the actual scholars who can do this type of work, that is what we need. And justice would look like for me, first of all, is going back to the root. We know small classrooms work. You can't think you're going to put 30, 35 kids in a classroom and, and get results. That's number one. Number two, we need veteran teachers. We need to have a more robust, thoughtful teacher pipeline. Teachers need mentoring. You know, Erica Miner says it best. Teachers' working conditions are students' learning conditions. If you look at the conditions of some of our schools, oh, my word, you have schools right now that don't have clean water. You have schools right now that where the air is actually polluted and doing harm to children's bodies. Like the air in the school is causing learning, disabil learning disabilities. How are you? Like that is just unbelievable. So we need state of art schools. We need curriculum that is created by the community, for the community, where we have scholars like Goldie Muhammad and literacy scholars doing this type of work. That's first and foremost. We have to have schools that are looking at children and saying, I'm going to meet you where you are and I'm going to put, and I'm going to move you with the, with the highest level. Now, again, testing. Do I think testing is bad? No. Do I think children need testing? Yes. Do I think we need a multi-billion dollar industry that destroys black lives through high stakes standardized testing? No. We need them out. We need the testing industry out. Yes, we need tests. Of course we need tests. I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but I, we don't need individuals who make profit ensuring that black folks do poorly on these tests, ensuring that when you don't do well on the test, then they profit off that test. They will sell you the kit, the other kit, bring in their um, folks who can help. Like, they just, they make a, a tons amount of money and they lobby to have more tests. They spend millions of dollars lobbying for more tests. So yes, we need tests, but we need schools and communities to decide what kind of tests that we need. And justice means you fund justice. In 2016, we learned that black schools and schools of color are receiving $23 billion less in funding than their white counterparts. $23 billion? What, what, what am I gonna do? Like that's, that's mm -hmm. just an absurd amount of money to think about. So justice is when you properly fund justice, you put the people and the scholars and the teachers who can do this work. You give us state-of-the-art schools that are not gonna kill us. We have schools with water. There is robust programming and sports and arts and all of these things. It's not, what we're asking for is not crazy. What we're asking for is not radical. It is what education should be. This is not a, this is not like, oh my God, they want schools with clean air and water. They want veteran teachers. They want money that is adequate for what they need. Like that's not crazy. They want to be able to teach their children about their history. <gasps> like these things are not wild that we're asking for. They're not wild, but I think you know, this is what I this is what I fear. I fear that it's possible to get everything we want in that agenda and still not have educated black people, because we talk oftentimes about education in terms of non-educational interventions. 
So I so I think everything you just said is absolutely true. Of course, we should have running water. Of course, we should have adequate funding and school sizes that work. Of course, we should not be putting kids into schools that look like starter prisons, right? Like, but 50% of our kids right now are in suburban schools. People don't often talk about that. 50% of Black children now are in suburban schools that were supposed to be the glory land. Leroy McCoo, I think his name is, or uh, Leroy McCoy, I can't, I can't remember his name. He has a book called The Promised Land on this about what's happening with those Black kids, that other 50%, because we never talk about them. We act like they don't exist. And, you know, for so many years, the suburbs were seen as the like the the, the, the destination, the place you should be going, the moving on up, you know, the, the whole kind of like, you know, uh, uh, upward mobility place that you go. And it turns out that sometimes those schools have a lot more resources and things going on and they're still not educating black children because they don't focus on educating black children. Right. And and so for me, justice would look like, number one, getting results with black children. Right. Because we know literacy is important. So I need to I need some evidence. What's the evidence that you are actually getting black people across the finish line with 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 numeracy, literacy? Can they graduate from high school capable of doing something and surviving in a very brutal, ruthless economy? Right. Like that's th those are the things that I think we need as metrics. So the standardized testing talk, the talk about, you know, the, the class sizes and all that. I think it's an area of safety for the system to focus on those things without focusing on the academic part because um, we do need teaching, we need learning. Like, for instance, here's reparations. Teachers College, uh, Lucy Culkins, um, um, The Science of Reading, right? So we discover that uh, the way that Black educators used to teach reading actually was the better way to teach reading to our children. And then we find out that white folks had some fads in the 1970s and the 1980s that they fell in love with, Ruby Bridges and, and Lucy Culkins and all these other people. Now, who's going to repair the generations of, of people that were taught reading the wrong way? Right. Like what's going to happen now? They're admitting it like Mia mm -hmm. Culpa. Oh, my God. You know that all that stuff we said since the 70s. Well, it turns out we was wrong. OK, but Dr. Love, I need you to step in and say to them, OK, it's one thing to admit wrong. Now, what are you going to do about it? Right. Because you've had several generations of people who I mean, black teachers used to teach the way that you were supposed to. Do. I mean, they used to, Vanessa Siddle Walker's work will tell you that black teachers were getting results measurable mm -hmm. results with black children mm -hmm. all the way up until 1954. They were closing gaps all the way until 1954. Uh, in a very brutal system, they were making it happen, right? And there were ways to measure it and to know that it was taking place. But in the 1970s, you know, the school system started doing all kinds of fancy, fuzzy things and whatever, and, you know, it kind of changed. And I'm a 70s kid. You, you, in your book, you say you're an 80s kid. I just want to know what's going to be done for us and for our kids that repairs that because we can't keep putting kids in the classrooms with people that don't know how to teach. Listen, you know, what I said earlier, I think it still stands for the, for the example that you just gave. Without white intervention, they think our lives are tragic, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and here we are again. And, 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 and again, I don't, I don't want us to act like the things that I just named, if they happen, then that won't happen. If those things happen that I just named, that would mean this country has done some serious work, mm -hmm. like some serious work. That's not just like, yeah, but no, 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 no. If we were really to think about the things that we are naming right now that this country actually did, I don't want to shortchange that. I don't want to just move past that and say, well, what about that? No, 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 no. You mean this country, the United States of America decided to properly fund black children? This country, United States of America decided to put veteran teachers in classrooms with black children? This country decided to build state-of-the-art schools for black children in this country? We just can't walk past that as if, well, yeah, but what about? No, that would mean that this country had a moral intervention. Mm -hmm. And we would get to those metrics. Of course, if this country actually was bold enough and brave enough and courageous enough to turn their lens towards justice when it comes to education. So we can't walk yeah. past that. For this country to say, we're gonna, we're gonna stop policing black children and putting police in schools, that would, oh my God, that means, I don't even, like that right there would mean that we have done some amazing work on the ground, that we have organized and that we have really changed the moral compass of this country. Now, do I think it's possible? Yes. Will I see it in my lifetime? Not quite sure about that. But it is possible. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't ever want to just shortchange those solutions as if 
they're so tangible, they're so right around the corner. Because if that was the case, many people smarter than you and I would have gotten it done. It is so much resistance and so much racism and anti-blackness and white supremacy that when we try to make the smallest intervention for our children, the pushback is massive. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great place to stop. I think you, um, you hit on a very powerful uh, kind of last thought there. Um, what I said earlier, I really mean the world needs to hear from you. Uh, the world needs to hear from all of our black scholars. And we need to hear these, these, we need to hear your research and the arguments that you're having and the the, the dialogue and the debate. We need to be treated as like intelligent people. I consider myself mm -hmm. a student, so I'm learning from your book, I'm learning from your voice. And then you mentioned a whole bunch of other black scholars who I've read all of them, or I'm I'm like, I'm trying to digest. You know, some of y'all get a little too fancy with your, with your stuff. <laughs> I just want to say that right now. Like, you know, here's the thing. I, people know this about me. I actually read dissertations as like a as a way of educating myself, but there's parts of those educations I are those dissertations that I routinely don't look at, like all the stuff with the Greek letters and all that stuff. I just jump past those parts, <laughs> but, but but I need to find a way to get my people to be able to have that information still, right? Like we need to hear from y'all. So thank you so much for first of all, thank you for dedicating your life to studying us. And thank you for thank dedicating you. your life to getting us some answers to some of the most vexing questions that we have. I appreciate you, you for doing that. Your book is called Punished for Dreaming, How School Reform Harms Black Children and How We Heal. Um, what's the big takeaway that you want people to take away from this book? What's, your, what's, the, what's the headline that you want them to get? I think what I want them to understand is that the last 40 years of educational policy has only been 40 years and we can change it. This may seem as if this is how education has always been, but it has not. It has only been going down this road for 40 years. So we have a lot of organizing to do, but we can, it's possible to change it. This has not, have, this has not been education for a century and two centuries. It's been mm. 40 years. We got it. We can change it. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thanks for what you do. Thank you for having right. me.